been studying seven habits of strong Christians. And we're eight weeks into it. How's that? We didn't quite get a habit a week, did we? Yeah, I'm pretty hot. We need to turn down a lot. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Seven habits of strong Christians. You still hear me? Test one, two, three. Test, test, test. There we go. Test, test. Good, thank you. The secret to strong Christian living is in your daily routine. Our daily routine dis- determines how victorious we are going to live. Amen? And we have a decision to make. Is victory important to you? In the United States today, victory over the devil has not been a priority in the church. Or else he wouldn't be having it so easy. We have sought after leisure. We have sought after free time. We have sought after self. We have become self-indulgent. We have become self-improved. We have become self-over-improved. We have forgotten the call of Christ to crucify self. And that if he be lifted up, he will draw all men unto himself. Amen? Amen. We have seen that some of the habits, the first habit was that strong Christians will feed their spirit. The second habit is that strong Christians will build their faith. The third is that they will speak the word. The fourth is that they will control their thought life. The fifth is they will walk in praise. Amen? Amen. So we have five habits that if we were doing on a daily basis, we will be experiencing more victory. And we will be stronger in our mission and in our calling than ever before. Amen? Amen. This week we go to our sixth habit. The sixth habit for strong Christians is to live in prayer. We walk in praise, but we live in prayer. Amen? Amen. Walking, living, daily routine. To live in prayer. I want to talk a little bit about prayer. Now, I've taught on prayer. I've taught on discipleship. Some of these are revisits and some of them are repackaging. But guess what? The Word of God ain't changed since the last time I preached it. It ain't changed. And if we ain't doing it, I'm going to preach on it again. Until we get it right, you're going to be hearing it. Amen? Now, I came from a denomination that I love, that I still honor and still respect, but every week I heard a salvation message every week, 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 with an invitation every week. Some of the churches I was in hadn't had visitors in four years. And everybody that had been there had gotten born again, twice, some of them, because they needed it, amen? You know what I mean? But it was all the time and all the time and all the time. I understand that mentality. I understand where they were coming from in their heart. But I also know that I saw people saved and then disappear and be lost forever because they were not learning how to be strong Christians. I am going to preach the gospel and I am going to have invitations and I am going to give you an opportunity to answer the call of Christ in obedience. But after that, it's my job to make sure that you can walk and stay in Him. And once we've learned to walk and stay in Him, then it is my duty to make sure that we storm the gates of hell as an army who has been discipled and been disciplined in the salvation which is theirs. You see, when you get born again, it ain't the end, it's the beginning. It's the beginning. And so you're going to hear the word. And you're going to hear it often. And it's going to be repeated. And some people may say, again? Yes. Yes. Until we get it right, we're going to march until it's right. We're going to paint until it's right. We're going to play the musical instrument until it's right. Because practice 
makes perfect. And so it is in the Word of God. Did you know that the more you witness to people, the easier it becomes? The more you stand up to the devil, the easier it becomes. The more you pray and read your Bible, the easier it comes. Amen. So we're going to talk about living in prayer. First of all, prayer results in intimacy. Strong Christians have to have an intimacy with the Father. They walk in intimacy, they talk in intimacy, and they live in intimacy. And people who are estranged and a little separated from the Father do not walk in the same victory as those who have an intimate relationship. And guess what? Prayer is intimacy. I've joked before that when we're in love, when we're in puppy love, and we're in high school, and we have met the person that we know is the perfect person for the rest of our life, and there will never, ever, 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 ever be anyone that I love as much as I do now that I'm in the eighth grade. Yeah. Be sure of that. I will never, ever be so much in love as I am right now. <laughs> And that we're, in, we're on the phone together late at night and we're talking about the things we did today and the things we're going to do tomorrow and how much we really love each other. And as we're talking, we get into one of those, no, you hang up first. No, you hang up first. No, you, you say goodbye. No, I'll say goodbye. Okay, I really mean it this way. This time, good night. I'm still here. <laughs> what are we doing? We're being intimate with one another. How many of you know it's safer to be intimate over the phone than it is in a car? <laughs> Let them talk on the phone, parents. Let them talk on the phone, okay? Give them that space to talk on the phone. But they're building intimacy. And I just can't be the one to say goodnight. I can't be the one to say goodbye. I can't be the one to end this bliss that we're feeling right now. How many of you can say that you have that kind of relationship with your Heavenly Father? where there's bliss, and there's intimacy, and there's joy, when prayer is no longer a task that has to be fulfilled to please someone. Yeah. That's how many marriages get into a place where we have to please one another as a task. Be a task. The intimacy is gone. The love has waned that want to because I can has got to be alive in us, in our marriages, in our relationships with God. Yes. Look with me at Psalm 145. Psalm 145, verse 18. Now, either you believe this verse or you don't. Right. Either you believe this or you don't. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. Good. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. We just stop right there. How's that for intimacy? When I call, he's near. How come then prayer is sometimes the last resort for our problems? Why is it the last thing we turn to rather than the first thing we turn to? The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. You can't get any more truthful than prayer. I need thee every hour. Lord, hear my prayer. Hear my prayer. The Lord has promised that he will be near when we call to him. Guess what? You know how many times as a pastor I have people come to me to counseling and they say, well, you know, I've been praying, I just feel like it ain't going any higher than the ceiling. I'm praying, it feels like the words are dribbling out of my mouth and not going any farther. Oh, Lord, plop. Lord, where are you? Plop, plop. I feel like God ain't hearing me. I feel like God is not, is not next to me. I feel like God has turned his back on me. I feel like I am praying and the heavens are brass, the psalmist said. Brass, it's just banging back and forth off of it. You know, in those days, drums and stuff were made out of brass. You can still go to Jamaica and hear the metal drums today that could be played off of metal. And they had metal drums in the temple. And they played those brass drums. And my, my prayers are like brass. They don't get through. I can't get through. And I don't want to be trite with those people. And I don't want to be unloving. But I have to remind them, 
If you don't feel next to God, guess who moved? Guess who moved? He didn't. He has committed himself in life and in death to be near to you. There's no pulling that back. He's done everything in life he can. He's done everything in death he can. And he's resurrected to prove it. So he is going to be there. And so many times we have unconfessed sin in our life. Many times we're trying to do things our way and pray and cover our tracks. You know, we're covering our tracks with prayer, but we're hoping that the secret sin doesn't get found out. And suddenly we feel this disconnect from God. But how many of you sometimes could understand what I'm about to say? But sometimes I pray and I pray and it feels like the Lord has not heard me. The Lord has not connected to me. He's not paying attention to me. And it's because he might be saying, do you believe my word that I'm near even if you don't feel me? Can you trust my word more than your feelings? And I can pray and say, whether I feel your presence or not, I will enjoy it. As an act of faith, I will enjoy your presence. As the psalmist said, in the days when you were near to me, I felt you. And so now I remember those days. You've done it in the past, and you'll do it again. And my faith is stronger than my feeling. Do you realize those people would not have to come to counseling over their lack of connection with prayer if they believed that the Lord was still near whether they felt him or not? Listen, strong Christians don't live in their feelings. They live in the intimacy of prayer. Amen. The intimacy that prayer promises. Look at Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29, verse 12. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Boy, don't you wish the Lord would just lay it out for you? Why is he so secretive? Why does he hide what he means? Why do you have to work so hard at understanding it? Let me, let me help you with this verse, okay? Then you will call upon me. We all get that? Okay. And come and pray to me. In the Hebrew it says, come and pray to me. In the English it says, come and pray to me, yeah. And I will listen to you. And then there's a period. Did that help you understand? Was that deep? Did I help you dig out the truth there? <laughs> then you will call upon me and, I, and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. There is an intimacy that can only be developed through prayer. Through prayer. Too many of us depend too much on family and friends to talk to and dump on and we say things and tell things we ought not to people that should be taken in prayer because your family and your friends can't do a thing about it. God can change the circumstances. Do you think that that could be a problem with social media today? How many people share on social media things that they should be sharing with their Heavenly Father. Yeah. It is a problem, isn't it? We, do you know how much junk is out there? Do you know how much people talk about their personal life out there? Do you know how much stuff they say about that? Oh my goodness. You might as well, yeah. I, one of the things that I tell my counselors, my, being a psychologist and teaching in college, and many of the people that I teach are going to be counselors. And I know that in the last two years of their education, they're not going to hear much conservative Christian thought, shall we say. So I shovel a little bit in the two, first two years of college, okay? I give them a little bit. And one of the things that I tell them is, as a counselor, no one ever hired you or paid for you to be their garbage can. Do you know how many people want to, want to counsel with pastor? 
the pastor, would you counsel with my cousin? Would you counsel my, my daughter, my grandchild? And all they want me to do is be a garbage can and sit there and go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, really, you hate your parents? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, and it's deserved because they weren't nice to you? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, that'll be 40 bucks, see you later. Do you know how many counselors charge to be garbage cans? And guess what? Nobody gets better afterwards. Counseling takes direction. I must direct you to a better way, or else I haven't earned my keep. You have not been called to be Christian garbage cans for other people to dump into, and it ain't strong Christianity to sit there and say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay, I feel your pain. Because you can't feel your pain and you can't help them, and the only one who can is Jesus. And if you're not directing them to Jesus, then you are wasting both of your time. I know it feels good sometimes. just feels good to get it off of my shoulders. Oh, it just felt good to dump and to talk. Oh, it just felt so cleansing to share with you, my brother, how I really feel. Oh, I feel so much better. Oh. Until the next time that circumstance happens. Because you ain't no better, you just flush the toilet. And I don't mean to be crude, but there's going to be a time when you need to return to that utility. Jesus can take the problem and fix it. Prayer leads to intimacy. Prayer results in strength. Prayer can build us up in strength. Look at 18.1, Luke 18.1. Again, we could take two weeks and study this in the Greek if you'd like. But let's look at what it says, okay? Maybe it'll mean something in the English anyway. Let's just take a stab in the dark. Now, Jesus was telling them a parable to show them that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. I think I got that the first reading. I don't know about you. Let's look at a couple of different important things, okay? Jesus was telling them that at all times, how many times? All times that they ought to pray and not lose heart. How many of you can think of sometimes the last 90 days you may have lost heart? I know, some of you want to commit Harry Carey the day after the election and things like that. You know, I, know, I understand, I feel your pain, uh, flush. But anyway, <laughs> just thought I'd be consistent, okay? I'll listen to your problems, but guess what? Jesus was teaching his disciples that in all times, in every place, they are to pray and not to lose heart. And guess what? The ones who took it seriously, we called apostles. Why? Because strong Christians live in prayer. Some of the disciples listened to what he said and became apostles. Do you want to be a church member your whole life? Do you want to be a marginal Christian your whole life? Would you like to raise up to the level of disciple sometime? where you show the discipline of the teacher and what he calls you to do? And would you like to take that next step of being an apostle, one who he can trust to send out? Yes. Your daily routine and your choice is to choose victory. And praying is a part of that. It will strengthen you. Look at Acts 2.42. Acts 2.42 says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. How often? 
continually, continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship. Now, you say, am I just supposed to walk around like this? Oh, Lord, I thank you so much, and I praise you, and I'm praying for you, and you fall off the stage. Am I supposed to do that while I'm driving? Oh, Lord, I just want to... Who said you had to close your eyes to talk to Jesus? Who said you had to put your hands together to talk to Jesus? Who says you can't have a conversation in your head with Jesus when you're doing your work at work? Listen, you're going to talk in your head anyway. You might as well talk to somebody who can do something about it. Doesn't your mind wander when you're doing the dishes? When you're, you know, well, when we're loading the dishwasher. And when you're vacuuming, when you're, well, when the Roomba's doing it. Well, when we're watching TV then. When you're watching TV, doesn't your mind wander once in a while and you talk to the TV? It doesn't change the story one lick I've tried. Oh, don't go in there. He's got a hatchet. Oh, don't, don't open the door or whatever. They don't pay attention. At all, they go ahead and do it. But how many times can I be reflecting and speaking to the Father? And now I'm gaining that intimacy and I'm being strengthened. I'm being strengthened through the activity. How many of you believe that the people that we're talking about in Acts, the second chapter, went on to change the world because they were strong. Strong in the gospel and strong in the way of God. Amen? Amen. Three, prayer results in victory in battle. Oh, man. Anybody need that? Look at Ephesians 6. If you don't need victory in battle, you're dead. Ephesians 6, verse 18. With all prayer and petition... Pray when it's convenient. Pray when you have time. What? Pray when you really have a need and you can't do anything else. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. That means it doesn't have to be out loud. No. It doesn't have to be out loud. I can pray in my Spirit. Now, some people say this means to pray in tongues, and I understand what they're saying. But you know what? I walk in the Spirit, and it doesn't mean to walk in tongues. Okay? I can sing in the Spirit, and it doesn't mean it has to be in tongues. How come all of a sudden prayer has to be in tongues? Because they say so. I don't believe that teaching. I believe that it's praying in my spirit. That's my inside, my inner man, the part that communes with God. It means my hurts and my groanings and the things I can't even put into words. I am praying in the Spirit with this in view. What is in the view? Why am I doing that? Why would I pray at all times in the Spirit? Be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. I'm praying for others. When I don't have anything that I need to pray for for me, believe me, there are people out there that need your prayers. There are Christians who are dying today at the rate of about 300 a day in Africa and India for one reason, and they are believers in Jesus Christ. 300 a day are being hacked to death with machetes and having their houses burned because they believe in the cross. When's the last time I spent 10 minutes in prayer for them? When's the last time I prayed for villages that are being burned by Muslim extremists because they're Christian villages and their pastors are being decapitated? Now you say, is that really happening? Stop reading about Biden and read about the gospel and you'll learn something. Stop reading conspiracies and stories and get involved in the gospel. Get involved in the Word of God. Get involved in what matters. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit and with this in view. Be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Be on the alert means wake up. Wake up. Get out of your stupor. 
Get out of your slumber. Get out of your sleep that everything's okay and that you can sit there in your barca lounger and watch TV and the world will be all right because in our, in our belief in Christianity and our family, people are dying and you're not alert to it. You're not paying attention to it. You're being lulled to sleep while the devil has his way, not only in this country, but in others. Yes, we have to pray for the foolishness in this country. Yes, we have to be alert to it. But it's not the only thing that we are called to do. We have a universal church and believers who are suffering for Christ. And we need to be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. If you need help finding Christians that need prayer because they're being persecuted, I guarantee you that 32 seconds of typing on Google will give you more than you can read in a lifetime. And if you can't find it on Google, you let me know and I'll get you subscribed to some magazines that do nothing but follow the persecution of the church international. And all they want is a donation every once in a while to help the ministry going. You don't have to pay for the magazine. There are needs out there that the sleeping church in America is not even aware of. And we wonder why the world has gone to hell in a handbasket. For over 30 years, Christian boys and girls were becoming instant orphans as Muslim extremists went into their villages and hacked their parents to death and kidnapped the children and then sold them into slavery in the Muslim world. For 30 years, it happened only to the Christian villages. Sudan is divided into three different groups, a secular group, a Muslim group, and a Christian group. And there they are in the Christian group, wiping us out. And until Franklin Graham and Samaritan's Purse started collecting money and literally going in and buying children out of slavery, did the church ever wake up? But did we really? Did we really do anything about it? And poor Franklin found out he was doing the wrong thing because the more he paid, the more they kidnapped. So he began to try and evangelize the leadership of Sudan. And now Christianity is spreading in the Sudan in the midst of the persecution. The churches are growing again, knowing that tomorrow they may have to give their life for the gospel. And when's the last time you prayed for the Sudanese Christian church? We're not alert. We're not on the alert with perseverance and petitioning for all the saints. We are asleep in our reverie of comfort. And insiders and outsiders threaten to steal our country and our way of life. And most of us are shaking heads and going, how did this happen? Where did this come from? We have televisioned and social media our way into our mess. Amen. Had we been doing what the Father called us to do in being strong, vibrant Christians, attacking the gates of hell around the world, I do not believe we would find our place where we are today. I will close today. We're not through. We're only on C and we got D and E to go. So we're probably going to have seven strong habits of a Christian, nine and ten. But we'll pick it up next week. Amen? Amen.